Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped turned upside down. It only took a minute for me to sit right here. I'll tell you how I changed my life from being down to my best year. In Westbrook, Columbia, I was broken and dazed on a computer is where I spent most of my days chilling out, programming, and studying in schools, learning insight, gaming, and heaps of other tools. So when a couple of guys who were up to no good start participating in the neighborhood, I get a nice warm feeling, smile from ear to ear, knowing I can make a difference to the future of my peers. See, for too long we have accepted that education, one, must be boring, and two, might not be available to everyone on earth. But things are starting to change. The development and improvement of educational technology and the increased availability of personal computer and smart devices are enabling a revolution in education. In 2015, I remember seeing a short clip on the internet that changed my life. It was the promo video for the Global Learning X Prize, a $15 million competition to develop an application that would allow children to teach themselves literacy skills within 18 months. I got excited to the point where I felt like I was having a manic episode, writing down pages of ideas and making big plans on how I'd succeed. It wasn't long after this epiphany that I saw a hugely inspirational TED talk by Sagata Mitra, describing how kids could perform amazing self-directed learning when given the tools to do so. Sagata Mitra started by leaving a computer in a rural Indian village and found kids quickly teaching themselves how to te use the technology. The kids were mad at him for leaving a computer in English only, but they still taught themselves English so they could learn whatever was on the computer. Whether it was DNA replication or neural communication, they were that intrigued and determined to learn. A similar study was completed by the One Laptop Per Child organization. They dropped off taped up boxes with tablets preloaded with applications to children in Ethiopian villages without any instructions. After five days, each kid was using dozens of apps a day. After two weeks, they were singing alphabet songs. And after five months, they had learned to hack the operating system so they could unlock features that had been blocked. <laughs> there have been Africans for Africa left out of the loop. Over the years, they have paid for the lack of trade with a lack of spices in their soup. But more importantly, a lack of exposure to new groups, new technologies, new perspectives, and new moots. No doubt Pangea would have made globalization a hell of a lot easier. But once the world's poorest can benefit from an easily distributed chorus of quality edtech pills, then they too can independently avoid avoidable ills, kills, and wills. In the late 1980s, Laven Wenger started publishing books about apprentice tailors in Liberia, where they found something very interesting. When the tailor's mathematics skills were tested in a situation where the skills were used daily, in a street shop interacting with their community, the young workers did very well. But when they were tested with standardized tests in a classroom, they made lots of mistakes. Laven Wenger called this situated learning, as they found that learning occurred in social situations with other people, and that if students were put in real-world scenarios, learning would occur automatically, as the students can easily see why the skills they are learning are important. The problem is, it would take too many resources to provide all students with an authentic real-world scenario for every learning task every day. That's partly why the science of teaching is currently evolving into the science of facilitating self-directed learning, as more edtech tools and information are available on the internet. It's important to teach students skills around self-directed learning so they can learn and adapt independently. But it is even more effective if self-directed learning is fun and immersive. That's where video games come in.
See, educational technology best be done through enjoyment, providing a choice and allurement, rather than rote BS that teaches kids to be bored and then scored and then bored and then scored. If designed and executed correctly, video games can help directly to get students excited and immersed in a diverse and pleasant universe. A universe that can be full of learning and if done right will leave players yearning for an environment where they're always included and the relevance of knowledge cannot be refuted. Video games are the perfect way to regularly practice situated learning as they allow students to run visual simulations of real world scenarios in their head. James Paul G explained how students need to run in their head a simulation of actions, images and experiences that give context to words and concepts that are being learned. These visualizations help the brain make connections with other relevant memories so that as new memories are formed, they can be linked to old memories, making it easier for the word or concept to be revisited in the future. These benefits were backed up by research from the Max Planck Institute, which found that playing commercial video games increased grey matter in the brain, the growth of neurons, memory formation, strategic planning, and fine motor skills. Naturally then, it stands to reason that the technology that can improve visual and auditory simulations will be more immersive and therefore better at connecting neurons to relevant memories. Future educational video games will make use of this feeling of lifelike immersion using virtual reality, augmented reality and holograms. Virtual reality games will put players in a position where they can visualise an action or task and feel as though they are physically going to complete that action. Augmented reality and holograms will turn any environment into an incredibly interactive virtual classroom. These days it can be hard to pay attention to one task at a time unless all of your senses are satisfied, which is why the video game medium is so good at consuming attention and containing procrastination. Video games are most immersive when there are interesting storylines and beautiful atmospheres and music tingling all the senses. So far, taste and smell aren't common in video games, but one day you'll probably be able to wake up and smell the coffee or napalm in the morning. <laughs> we know that young people are often in the zone when playing video games, so why not make the time spent playing video games worthwhile? It's great if students can feel so entrenched and drenched in a task that they fast forget the mask they wear. As they feel the flow of being in the zone, everything else drops low, so all they know is what's currently on show. Their full attention beckoned every second. If VR video games makes kids feel the same, who are we to blame? Maybe we should put less blame on the name video game so we too can go with the flow. While the future of EdTech is exciting, there are still many challenges with EdTech that we need to overcome. A friend of mine living in a small village in Tanzania was well aware of these problems when we were working on the Global Learning X Prize together. The main challenges she found were social isolation, battery life and electricity access, and equal access to technology. While lonely education is better than no education for those who don't have access to the internet, for those who do have access to the internet, online learning groups are a good solution to social isolation. There are already many of these set up, such as Dr. Mitra's self-organising learning environments that connects facilitators to learners all over the world, as well as Duolingo, Reddit and other online forums where people can connect. Although universal access to the internet is a significant problem, worldwide internet could be here before 2025 thanks to SpaceX, Facebook's internet.org or Google's Project Loon. Even without these companies, 
the rate of adoption of the internet and solar electricity among developing countries is very promising, meaning that soon almost everyone on earth will have access to educational software and games. Another thing that makes the future of EdTech so exciting is the rapid adoption of smart devices all over the world. Since 2014, there have been more devices on Earth than people. And while not everyone currently has access to a device, there are many great charities trying to make that happen, including One Laptop Per Child, Computer Aid, and Computers for Africa. Before the widespread access to digital technology, it was impossible to reach and teach everyone. But now that quality edtech is becoming very cheap and accessible, millions of children in developing countries can have technology and education for a fraction of the price. With the influx of people gaining access to the internet and all the information that comes with it, a problem that requires more careful thought is how to teach everyone how to discern between fact and fiction so they can spot and ignore fake and ill-informed news. Countries such as Sweden, Taiwan, Italy and India think it's such an important problem that part of their curriculum focuses on teaching kids how to differentiate between reliable and unreliable sources. It's important to learn that life isn't so black and white, and by following complex storylines and video games, combined with critical thinking and self-reflection, players can learn about and experience the complexities of life. Ed technology has the potential potency to urgently disrupt an ignorant society from an irreversible catastrophe. If only we had the foresight to see that the future mites might not be as understanding about the embarrassing standing we are currently standing in. Hopefully these are the future mites that will fix the introduction of machine battle fights, the current carbon imbalance, and unregulated non-universal artificial superintelligence. But first, this information needs to be shared freely with all of those that merely want to see more clearly and more fairly. So, if you're a parent and you want to hear ideas about how to raise kids by someone who doesn't have any, well, this is your lucky day. <laughs> because the best way parents can prepare for education these days is to be familiar with technology, how it works, and what educational technologies are out there. Technology is much like food. If you can get your kid to consume good content without knowing it, you've done great. But it would be difficult to get your kid to choose to eat delicious educational technology if you had never even heard of Kerbal Space Program, Minecraft, or my educational video game, Rocket Island. Some parents think that this new technology is for their kids' generation but everyone needs to be up to date with these things. Technology is already changing faster than society, and with people now living to be much older, more and more people are living in a world they don't understand. Currently, kids are often the ones to teach their parents and grandparents about changes to technology and society, and then, over a decade later, they are allowed to vote about how technology affects our lives much after their lives are shaped significantly by it. I think young people should help make decisions about how technology affects us all and what technologies are used to educate them. To improve the curriculum, teaching digital literacies along with collaboration, communication, creativity and critical thinking are a good start. But it would also be great to make students aware of the impact social media and technology can have on well-being and about self-fulfillment, community engagement, and how online communities differ from face-to-face -face communities. Since my accident, I've had a great sense of gratitude towards the developers of new technologies and societies that support new innovations and innovators. I know the idea of new technology can be scary for some people, but for a lot of people who rely on new technology, for health and accessibility and climate change issues, a plateau in innovation is also scary. But I am optimistic about the future. I was able to reach my potential and contribute to society and the economy 
like millions of others, could and will do if they too have access to an education, or at least the internet and some guidance so they can self-teach and empower themselves. By not allowing poor humans to reach their potential, we are holding back all of humanity from reaching its potential. Your well-being and others seeing cutting-edge technologies may indeed seem unrelated, and like making a link would be unsubstantiated. But the human race is a team unseparated, long-lost brothers and sisters simply excommunicated. Poverty to me, I see an unutilised resource waiting to be set free, to be educated so they can contribute to the economy and be their own me with a well-deserved self-esteem. The sisters and brothers and others that are stuck in this dreary go-round will continue to be bound and drowned, unable to inspire and astound, unless together we turn the ship around and make sure everyone who wants it is found. <laughs>